So today I propose to just go over the uh, second half of that exercise sheet that we started on Tuesday or on Thursday last week. I'll just go through those and we'll just kind of do them together. Uh, it's, it's fine if you didn't bring them, I'll just do them up on the screen. Uh, great if you did do, do them, so now you can tell me whether I got these right or not. Uh, and then we're just going to talk about missing premises. Missing premises is just sort of the next step after you've learned how to draw an argument diagram, given, the prem given some set of premises, learning how to identify missing premises allows you to fill in bits that were unspoken or un unarticulated in the original argument. Hang on. <clears throat> So the first job is just to do these like slightly more complex argument diagrams. So we'll start with here. This is this is my cat Dory. So is she adorable? So all cats are cute, and Dory is a cat, so Dory is cute. She's also friendly. Being cute and friendly are good reasons to keep a cat, so we should keep Dory. Right. So uh, again. This is, this is sort of like ultra simple childish language so that the structure of this argument should be completely clear to you. You should be able to just look at this and say, ah, I know exactly what the conclusion is. What is the conclusion of this argument? Did I hear we should keep the cat? Yeah, yeah, the conclusion is we should keep Dory. We did keep Dory, by the way. She's still living with us, so that's good. All right, so, and everything else in this specific argument is a premise, right? So the conclusion is we should keep Dory. Everything else is a premise for that. So just breaking it down into premises. And uh, again, when you're taking a bit of text and breaking it down into premises, your premises should have the following properties. They should be complete statements in and of themselves. So Dory is a cat, Dory is cute, Dory is cute, Dory is friendly. Like repeat the whole sentence that you need and you don't include things like and or therefore or any of those sort of connectives between sentences, little asides, extra bits that don't really contribute to what the statement is saying, what the premise is claiming. All get cut out, all get simplified. Don't be afraid to rephrase to make things clearer and shorter because this is how you get yourself a nice crisp picture of what's in the argument. All right, so given these premises, how do you think that they're structured? For somebody who hasn't already looked ahead at the slides. There's more than one layer here, right? Good, so let's, yeah, just deal with premise one and premise two. So uh, P1 and P2 are in a dependent relationship leading to P3, right? And we'd represent it like that. Okay, that's right, right? Because use the puzzle piece method. All cats are cute, Dory is a cat. The common part uh, of cat falls out, therefore we get Dory is cute, do you see that? Good? All right, now P3, P4, and P5. How are these structured? Yeah? Are three and four dependent as well? They look like it, right? But what are they dependent Seven. reasons for? So, four so here's, here's two ways you could structure this. You could say P4, P3, and P4 are reasons for P5. Does that seem right? That is not right. right. That's wrong. What you should do is say P3, P4, and P5 are all dependent reasons for the conclusion. Now, what was wrong with P3 and P4 being dependent reasons for P5? Why is that not quite right? That's right. So it's not, so the, the flow of this thing is that we say P3 and then we say P4 and they look related and then we say P5. And that might, might lead you to, to diagram it as P3 and P4 leading to P5. But this specific cat being cute and this specific cat being friendly is not a reason for, a, for believing P5. Right? It's, not an, it's not evidence for you to increase the likelihood of your belief in P5. Right? P5, if you didn't already believe P5, there's no reason why Dory being cute and Dory being friendly should cause you to suddenly start believing it, is there? So, and that's what this diagram says. P3 and P4 leading to P5 suggests that 
these are dependent reasons to believe P5. And notice what we're doing here. So we've added, we've added another layer to the description of the argument. So P1 and P2 are reasons for believing P3. Right? So which, which kind of makes it like a little sub-conclusion, right? So this, this little chunk here is like its own little argument. And then the conclusion of that little argument is used as a further premise in another argument. Uh, I propose to just call these all premises. Anything, let's, let's just, for the sake of this class, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it a sub-conclusion or whatever. For the sake of this class, let's only mark the last part of the argument as a conclusion, all right? Okay, so here's how I had it. This is probably the first, I think this is the first time we've seen a dependent relation that requires three things. But it, it, it is such a relation, right? So cats who are both cute and friendly are worth keeping. So there's a two-part antecedent, a two-part thing that needs to be satisfied for the third thing to follow as a consequence, right? If a cat is friendly but not cute, or cute but not friendly, then it won't satisfy the condition laid down in P5, right? Good. Happy with that? Not happy, but willing to accept it for the sake of learning? OK, good. <laughs> All right. OK, let's do another one. So either my upstairs or, or downstairs neighbors are playing music. Whenever my upstairs neighbors are home, their lights are on. Right now, their lights are off. So my upstairs neighbors aren't home. So my downstairs neighbors are playing music. OK. So what's the conclusion? Downstairs neighbors are playing music. This is what we're trying to infer. I propose to break it down as such. So P1, either my upstairs or downstairs neighbors are talking loudly. So it's an either or statement. This statement is true just in case one or the other of the things that it's saying either or are true. P2, whenever my upstairs neighbors are home, their lights are on. It's just a statement of fact about a regularity that you've observed, presumably is justified by being around a bunch and seeing what happens when they're home. P3, right now their lights are off. P4, therefore my upstairs neighbors aren't home. Conclusion, so my downstairs neighbors are playing music. Okay. Now, what's the structure of this one? Again, what we're looking for are the relationships of justification, the relationships of one thing being a reason to believe the next thing. And if there's nothing given as a reason to believe something, it's just a top level premise, right? It's a premise that isn't being argued for in the argument. So, P1, either my upstairs or downstairs neighbors are home. Whenever my upstairs or neighbors are home, their lights are on. Right now, their lights are off. What do you think? How, do, how should we structure this? Yeah. Okay, so P2, P3, are they dependent or independent reasons for P4? Dependent reasons for P4. Okay. Now, how does, so that's, that's good. That's, good. that's a good chunk of it. Now, how does P1 and conclusion fit it? Yeah. P1 and P4 are dependent. Good. So P1 dependently lead to the conclusion. Okay. So does that seem right to you all? So we start off, this was sort of like arranged misleadingly, right? We didn't have P1 be the top level. But so P2, uh, whenever my neighbors are home, the lights are on. P3, the lights are not on. Therefore. You can do a modus tollens, remember? Modus tollens says, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P, right? And this is one of the, the valid argument forms, right? So if my neighbors are home, their lights are on, their lights are not on, therefore my neighbors are not home, right? Uh, so, sorry, P1, P2, P3? So where would you have P1 here? As a dependent part of the inference?
sorry. Could you say, say that again? So. P3 as dependent reasons for P4, which then leads to the conclusion, yeah? Like that? OK, so either their downstairs neighbors are talking loudly. Whenever my neighbors are home, their lights are on. Right now, their lights are off. Therefore, my upstairs neighbors aren't home. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Do you see any strong reason to prefer one of the, like it's completely possible that either of these are legitimate ways to map this argument. It's also possible that there's some deep problem with one of them. Which I can, a prospect which I can see thrills you and excites you all. You're so thrilled to have this ambiguity and difficulty in these simple tasks I'm offering you. What did I say? I can't remember what I said. Okay, this is what, this is what I said. Um, so, okay, so let's see. Either A or B, let's see. I'll just do this in logic. A or B, uh, if C, then B, uh, C, therefore not B, uh, therefore A. Yeah, that works, actually. That works. So you kind of need, yeah, that works. I think P1, P2, P3, all those dependent reasons for 4 actually make sense. Yeah, good. So now we have two alternate ways of mapping this, yeah? Unless there's a problem with one of the other of these. Does anybody see a problem with one of the other of these ways of mapping this? Yeah. Right. Yes. OK, sorry. I remember this from using these slides last time that I, it shouldn't be talking loudly. It should be uh, playing music. So either my upstairs or downstairs neighbors are playing music. Let's, let's say P1 says that. I'm sorry. That's just straight up a typo on my part. Yeah. Not a it's too long to be a typo. I just screwed it up. So which premise do you think is unnecessary in this? Uh, not unnecessary. I just don't see how P1, P2, P3 are all dependent conclusions for P4. Oh, I see. I see. So uh, right. So perhaps uh, P1 is not relevant to establishing P4. So either my upstairs or downstairs neighbors are talking loudly isn't really a reason to say that my upstairs neighbors aren't home. Good. So that suggests that this, this is the diagram we should prefer, right? So uh, that either one of them is, sorry, not talking loudly, let's say they're playing music. That they're playing music is not a reason to believe, and it's certainly not, probably not a dependently reason with P2 and P3 to believe P4, my upstairs neighbors aren't home. Does that make sense, everyone? OK. So that would be, what, that would be a reason to prefer uh, this one the one that I put on the slide. Yeah? Yeah? And at the same time, like, um, we kind of need, like, either my upstairs or downstairs neighbor are talking and my upstairs neighbor are not home together to, like, actually lead to the conclusion. Because if we're just saying my upstairs neighbors aren't home, then, like, we can say maybe it's, like, someone else or neighbor. Right. Or, like, like neighbor from, like, the left or right. Right. You know? That's, I think that's true. So we do need the fact that either one or the other of them is making noise, plus the fact that one of them is not there to conclude it's the other one. So that's this bottom level here where P4 and P1 are in a dependent relation to C. Yeah? So this is another reason not to really like this one, because P4 by itself, just my upstairs neighbors aren't home, is not by itself a reason to believe the conclusion, is it? Right? 
if you forget how you justify this, so these are, these are justifications in this diagram for P4, but if you forget all of these and just say, well, I'm just considering P4, then you don't get the inferential relation between P4 and the conclusion. Good. Yeah? Can P4 be independently related to P3 being independently related? Sorry, can P1 be independently related to what? Leading to what? Leading to P4. Leading to P4. So we've got P1 independently, P2 independently, leading to P4. OK, so let's, let's look at these and see if. Sorry, P2. Ah, I see. P2 or P3 dependently related to P4, and P1 independently related to P4. OK, so now you ask yourself to find out whether that's accurate. You ask yourself, so forget about P2, P3. Just ask yourself whether P1 is independently a reason to believe P4. So either my upstairs or downstairs neighbors are talking loudly, therefore my upstairs neighbors aren't home. Does that make sense? No, no. Right, OK, good. So that suggests that P1 has to interact with at least something in order to be evidence for P4. We'll do some more. I think we'll do some more of these exercises on Thursday, so there'll be more chances to uh, play with this stuff. But I mean, this. Now that we're doing like multiple dependencies and multiple levels, this is about the level of complexity that you'll be dealing with throughout the rest of the course. Like this is the kind of formal complexity you'll have to deal with. And then for the rest of the semester, we're going to be laying kind of semantic or conceptual complexity on top of it. This is as formally complex as we'll get. OK, let's do another one. So if you touch, touch the electric, electric fence, you're going to get a shock. And a shock means intense pain. So if you, feel, if you touch the electric fence, you'll feel pain. Also, I have to pay the electric bill. So don't touch the electric fence. OK. Truly a cruel and indifferent line of reasoning. But nonetheless, let's talk about it. All right, so what's the conclusion? Don't touch the electric fence. Good. All right, and everything else is premises, right? Well, I'm I'll just tell you everything else is premises. Good, so P1, if you touch the electric fence, you're going to shock. P2, if you get a shock, you'll feel, feel pain. P3, so if you touch the electric fence, you'll feel pain. Let's just deal with those for, for now. How are those related? Yeah? Why would it be unnecessary? But is it OK to leave common knowledge out of your arguments? We'll talk about that for the rest of the class, actually. Sorry? Right. Um, could be. Could be. But like, it's nonetheless part of the argument as presented, right? So you could say, well, if I was writing this, I wouldn't have written it exactly like that. That's, that's fine. That's fair. But in terms of what we're trying to do now is just Analyze the argument as it was written, right? So that's, let's do that. Yeah. P1 and P2 are an independent relationship to P3. Good. P1 and P2 are dependent reasons for believing P3. I think this is an argument form we haven't talked about yet. Uh, uh, chain reasoning. I, it should be intuitive enough that you can just see why that should be the case, right? So if you say, uh, if x, then y. And if y, then z, then it just follows that if x, then z. Right? You can prove this in logic if you want, but like, it should just jump out at you that that's, that's how it works. right? So there's another kind of dependent relation. Both of those things have to be true in order to get the conclusion. These are not independent reasons for the conclusion. So this is, for p1 to p3, this is the right way of breaking it down. OK, now p4. And the conclusion. So, okay, so first of all, we've got P4 and the conclusion you have to plug into this thing. So how do they fit? Yeah? P3 and P4 are independent reasons to believe P3. Good. I think that's right. I think that's right. So like that. Yeah? Yeah? 
Uh, if you touch the electric fence, you'll get a shock. Also, have to pay the electric bill. Um, so, yeah, like, you could, if you wanted, so the question is, aren't P1 and P4 related? You could, if you wanted, represent P1 as a reason to believe P4. Well, oh, wait, no. No. No, you couldn't. So, yeah, no, P1 is not a reason to believe P4. Just the fact that you're, like, if you're in somebody else's field, then it doesn't follow, right? Like, you're just wandering through farmers' fields, and you can give, if you're in somebody else's field, you can give this half of the argument. So, like, don't touch the electric fence because you'll get a sh painful shock. Uh, but this part wouldn't be true anymore, right? If you're not paying the electric bill for this electric fence. Yeah? So could uh, P1 be independently related to P2 with P2 and P3 being uh, dependent, dependently related to each other leading to conclusions? Um, I don't think so. Let's draw that, though. Okay, so P1 independently to the conclusion, and then P2 and P3 dependently leading to the conclusion? Is that was the, this was the suggestion? Yes. Okay. And then P4 presumably off on its own also. So then we have three independent reasons for believing the conclusion. Okay, so uh, if you touch the electric fence, you're going to get a shock. Like, for practically anybody, that should be enough. You, that's, you wouldn't have to actually say the next two steps, right? Because all of you presumably know that it sucks to get electrocuted or to get shocked, right? So that's an implicit, we, we could, you could happily leave P2 and P3 as what we'll talk about as missing premises, right? And everybody would know what you're talking about. That would be, that would be a perfectly sensible way of talking. But given that we've got these explicitly laid out and your job is to analyze the argument as it was written, then I think that it makes more sense in this case to say, Actually, no, this is a sub-argument leading to the conclusion, yeah? Like, uh, don't talk like this. Obviously, this is too clunky for words. Like, but nonetheless, I think given that we were given this structure and it's kind of very explicitly, the steps are like laid out. If A, then B. If B, then C. Therefore, A, th therefore if A, then C. Like, I think that was fairly clear here, so you should represent and it gives you more of the structure of like, like how these parts are supposed to be interrelated. So I think this is a better way of, this captures more of how the argument was intended to be read, I would say. Right. Yeah? Uh, is it okay to leave out the whole premise dependent to the relationship between P4 and P2? Aha, okay, so why is, so the question is, can we just leave out the whole premise because he doesn't see the relationship between P4 and the conclusion? So, like, sometimes, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Uh, for the purposes of this kind of exercise, if you think it's kind of, well, it's, a, it's not a very good reason for the conclusion, but you also have the impression that the author is offering it as a reason, then you should represent it as an, a reason, and then what you just say about it is, look, P4 has a very weak logical relationship with the conclusion. Uh, what I'll suggest to you is that there is a missing premise in this argument, or there's actually several missing premises because there's, there's a, the conclusion is normative, right? The conclusion is about what you shouldn't do, and all of these are just factual premises. So there's a missing premise here, yeah, connecting P4, like I have to pay the electric bill, and paying high electric bills is bad, right? That's what you need to connect it to the conclusion, isn't it? This sort of like fact about what's good or bad. Similarly, you need a missing premise to connect P3. So we'll, say, we'll call this missing premise one and missing premise two. Maybe you like being electric. Maybe you like being shocked. You think it's fun to, to inflict pain on yourself, right? The assumption of the argument is that that's something that you want to avoid, that it's bad to get a painful shock. But that's a presumption that not 100% of the population would share, right? I don't know, maybe you're making a YouTube video and you think you'll, you'll just film the funny face you make and so it's, you have something more important than the pain driving you or something like that, right? So these are missing premises. These are missing normative premises in this argument. So that might be why it looks like these premises are unconnected. So let's, let's move right along. We'll get to these so that we can get to these, this idea of missing premises. All right. Last one, I think. Uh, so the company's headed for disaster. Our product is terrible. The CEO is incompetent. We have massive overhead and our branding is non-existent. It's a nightmare. Given the state of the company, I should be working on my resume. I think there's actually one thing that's not a premise in there, but 
So let's start off with what's the conclusion? Can you see your hand? Oh, isn't it? Oh, okay. Well, then that's not a premise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I should be working on my arithmetic. Given the state, I should be working on my arithmetic. Good. Good. So I think you could even shorten that just for the sake of for the sake of leaving out. And I haven't been as I watched the video again that I did last time, and I wasn't as rigorous about this as I should have. But uh, leave out things like given. So leave out the inference indicators in the statement of the conclusion. So the conclusion, I think that we should say here, and I might have also done this on the slide, but uh, yeah, I did it on the slide too. So I shouldn't have done that. I should have just said the conclusion is I should be working on my resume. So the question is, is shouldn't, couldn't that be a premise as well? I don't think that that's a premise because really what you're saying is the conclusion of the first part of the argument shows me that the conclusion is, of the second part is true. I think, that's, I think that's what that's saying. So given the state of the company and all of the other premises were about precisely the state of the company. So it doesn't get introduced as a new premise. It's just the relations from the earlier premises. And we'll see, let's diagram it. I, well, that should be clearer. So how does this go? How should this go? So P2 to P5, so P2, P3, P4, P5 are each an independent reason for P1, was it? OK. And then how does the conclusion get related? Oh, I did too. All right, so how is the conclusion related? Yell it out. P1 to conclusion, right. Good. Okay. So, that, yeah, that's what we got. Right. There's more premises in the lines than in the, <laughs> on the diagram. Right. All right. Lesson is don't, don't trust your teachers, I guess. All right, so the one on the blackboard has P5 in it. Does everybody agree that these are all independent reasons? They seem like, they seem like independent reasons for me. Like any one of P2 to P5 would be by itself at least something that should increase your, the credibility of P1 for you, right? They should, they should make your belief in P1 at least a little bit stronger, and therefore they are at least relevant but they don't depend for their relevance on each other being true. Any one of them by themselves is relevant to P1. And then P1 leads directly to the conclusion. Yeah? Any questions about that one? Good. All right. So we're going to have to kind of blast through this stuff about missing premises. I don't think it's too complicated. This is just sort of one more layer that we can add on to our argument mapping skills. Uh, so here's an argument. James owns a Mustang. Therefore, James owns a car. And we could represent it. It's pretty straightforward. I don't think that that should like, cause you any difficulty in understanding the structure of this thing. It's really just one premise and one conclusion. Uh, but suppose we're getting nitpicky. Suppose you didn't know anything about Mustangs. What would you need in order for that to be like, OK, so the game, the game here is to try to make this into a deductively valid argument. How do you turn this into an argument that's so certain that if the premises are true, you must believe the conclusion? Yeah. Mustang is a car, exactly. Did you look at the slides? No. Good. <laughs> then you're getting it. Good. Right. So, so given that, so Mustang also refers to a kind of horse. So if P1 says James owns a horse, then it clearly doesn't follow that he owns a car. But if if something is a Mustang, then it is a car is true, uh, then James owns a car follows deductively. Right? So this is, now this is a, an argument of the maximum possible logical strength. Yeah? OK, so often in normal conversations or in normal sort of giving and asking for reasons, stuff that's just super obvious gets dropped out. Right? Stuff that everybody would agree on, like Mustang is a kind of car. In this context, we'll assume we're talking about cars, right? So everybody knows that. Everybody agrees to it. It's not a matter of controversy. 
And when I told you James owns a Mustang, therefore James owns a car, you had no trouble making the connection between Mustangs and cars, right? Right? So if somebody said this to you, James owns a Mustang, if something's a Mustang, then is a car, you would find them to be like annoying and pedantic, right? It's a really slow and boring and nitpicky way of talking. So people don't talk this way and be glad that they don't because it would be really irritating if they did, right? So be glad that we don't say all of the missing premises in our arguments, but you need to be able to spot when a missing premise is operating in an argument uh, because sometimes they, people are sneaky and they pack in the really controversial premises into a missing premise. And then it's your job to articulate it and show why it's, you need to say, oh no, you also need to say this for your argument to work and now I'm questioning one of your premises. Uh, I'd like to suggest to you that this is kind of like a, you can do this as in, ter in terms of a reverse puzzle piece method. You can take basically the same method that you use to detect whether something is a dependent or independent relation and just run it in reverse to figure out what the missing premise should be. So uh, premise one, James owns a Mustang, uh, therefore James owns a car. Really what you want to do is create yourself a premise that includes the two bits of that, of the premise and conclusion, right? So our missing premise is constructed out of premise one, if something's a Mustang, and the consequent of the conditional, therefore it's a, James owns a car, you say, if something's a Mustang, then it's a car. So it's putting it in terms of a conditional, you could also put it in terms of a categorical, all, all Mustangs are cars, right? It doesn't matter whether you use the conditional or the categorical, so long as uh, it makes sense in the context. But, so do you see what we're doing here? Yeah. Yeah. So like for a scissor cut, would there be like a missing like premise like section or would we have to like be able to look down and like put in car and test the uh, I haven't written the test yet, so I don't know the answer to that. Um. <laughs> uh, I think what I'll do is I think the fair thing to do would be to explicitly mark this as this is the missing premise section, find the missing premise. Does that I mean that sounds like a pretty fair and reasonable way of doing it. When you're writing your argument analyses, unfortunately, the, like, I'm being so, like, Jack and Jill went up a hill here so that it's ultra clear what's going on. Anytime people are writing in a natural co language context, they're not so nice about that. And they don't tell you ahead of time where the missing premises are gonna be. So our learning goal here should be that you can identify missing premises even when you're not giving the hint, hint, nudge, nudge, look for a missing premise instructions, right? So that should be your goal here. Uh, for the in terms of test one, probably safer and easier if I just tell you, tell me what the missing premise is. Yeah? Okay, so that's the, we just decided right now how the test is gonna go. All right, so, uh, so does, it, does this reverse puzzle piece method thing make, make sense to you? So, you know, you've got one half of the puzzle piece and then your conclusion is like, Oh man, I'm bad at drawing puzzle pieces. <laughs> okay. You know, your conclusion is like this, your premise is like this, your conclusion is like this, and you can kind of infer that the missing piece must look, what the missing piece must look like in order to go from the premise to the conclusion. So uh, let's do an example. So Justin Trudeau is prime minister, therefore Justin Trudeau is trustworthy. So what do you need? You need to make this work. You need a premise, a missing premise in the middle to make, to connect up premise one and conclusion. Yeah. Prime is exactly, exactly. So if someone is a prime minister, then they are trustworthy, right? So that's the, if, if P1 and, uh, so this makes it into a deductive argument, doesn't it? Like a deductively valid argument, because if those first two things are true, the third thing must also be true. And we'll, what you did was just sort of like take the part of, okay, so where P1 is applying a property to a person and P2 is just saying, here's a rule. If some person has that property, then they have this other property, or if they fall into this category, they have this property, therefore they have the property. You're just kind of reverse engineering from what you need to what must be assumed by the argument. Okay. And, so when you're talking about something super obvious and super like common amongst all people, it makes perfect sense not to articulate it. 
But one of the things that you need to be on the lookout for when you're evaluating arguments is, did people sneak in something to the missing premises that's objectionable? Like in this case, if somebody's the prime minister, then they are trustworthy. That seems like a pretty lousy premise to me. That doesn't seem like a good rule in general. Like, if you believe there's ever been an untrustworthy prime minister, then you should reject this, right? Or if you believe there ever could be an untrustworthy prime minister, you should reject this. Regardless of how you feel about like Trudeau in particular, uh, if you believe it's possible for there to be an untrustworthy prime minister, this missing premise is very dubious. So the whole argument doesn't work, but it might not have been completely obvious to you if you just looked at P1 to conclusion that that's so. And if you're trying to argue, if, if this is an argument being presented to you by somebody, what you need to do is say, okay, look, there's a, you're not articulating some part of this argument. Here's the part that you're not articulating, and that's the part that I think we need to discuss, because I don't believe it, right? So that's the point of finding missing premises, is to draw out the unarticulated assumptions of the argument to make them available for critique and discussion. So uh, to go back to this stuff, there's tons of unarticulated assumptions in these arguments that we already saw, right? And I didn't try to make a big deal of them at the time just because, you know, you, you assume things so easily. It's so easy to make these natural assumptions. And if you didn't, like, you would be bad at reasoning. Like, if you couldn't just smoothly assume things that are nicely left in the background, then you would be no better than like an artificial intelligence program that can only do explicit reasoning. So my neighbors play their music so loud, my neighbors leave their garbage on the fire escape, therefore my neighbors are the worst. What missing premises might make this a stronger argument? Yeah. These are both reasons to believe that someone can Exactly, exactly. So now we have a much stronger argument. It's harder to prove that these are true, of course. These premises, so this might not be a, we didn't turn a weak argument into a sound argument. We turned an inductive argument into a deductive argument. And now we can really home in on what parts of this you think are right or wrong. So playing loud music makes you the worst. Well, I don't even know. So in this case, I don't even know what you mean by the worst. I think you're just using that, probably you're just using that non-literally, hyperbolically or something like that. But that seems to be assumed by this argument, right? If we're going to take this argument to be a really strong deductive argument. Similarly, Leaving garbage on the fire escape makes you the worst. So now what we've got are P1 and MP1 dependent reasons for the conclusion, and P2 and MP2 as dependent reasons for the conclusion. Right? Conclusion. Yeah? Uh, OK, so now this is what I want to warn you about. This is what people are constantly tempted to do. Uh, don't just add random premises, right? Don't just add things that you think would have made the argument stronger if they had been included. Uh, so here's an example of what not to do. Suppose you're given P1 and P2 and the conclusion. This textbook's expensive, it has no pictures, therefore the textbook is bad. Now, MP1 does make the argument stronger, right? So if a textbook is badly written, that's independently a reason to believe that the textbook is bad. But your job is not to produce the best possible argument when you're analyzing arguments. Your job is to figure out whether the argument as written was a good one. Right? And in this case, you're just adding a new premise, an entirely novel line of reasoning. So people are, people are often tempted to do this. So you're given P1 and P2 as independent reasons for the conclusion. And they just add a P3 on the side here. It's like, ah, you know, here's another thing that you could have said. And I, I get why the people have that instinct, uh, because you're just trying to like give, be maximally charitable, and maybe you've drawn P3 from some bank of things that you think are reasonable to assume. Right? So you're just like drawing P3 out of your background assumptions, common knowledge, and stuff like that. But for the purposes of this course, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't add in entirely new lines of reasoning, and don't do things like adding a, another layer on top of P1. So if P1 is given to you without evidence, it's not a missing, the evidence for P1 is not itself a missing premise, right? It's just, P1 is just given to you without argument. So as a rule, here's what you should do. Uh, 
missing premises should be dependent with something, always. Right? So uh, the point of a missing premise is the following. The point of a missing premise is to show how a given premise is actually relevant to the conclusion. You say, look, you gave me this premise one explicitly, and it's really not clear how it's supposed to lead to the conclusion. But if I assume missing premise one, which is like common and easy and straightforward and something that everybody would agree to, now I can see how it's relevant to the conclusion. Right? So you're just drawing out how the premises are supposed to be related to the conclusion, how they're supposed to be relevant to establishing it. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, what's the, what's the objection again? The, uh, yeah, so if you wanted to, so if, yeah, okay, in this case, if you wanted to connect up, uh, so premise two, and you could say missing premise one, sorry, let's do it like this, so. Premise one, this text was expensive. That's an independent reason to believe that it's bad. Premise two, it has no pictures. And having no pictures makes it boring. I think you would need to do, if you wanted to make it deductive, you would need another missing premise that, uh, so it has no pictures, things that pictures are boring. Uh, and then maybe missing premise two, boring things are bad. It's bad to be boring. That's the kind of normative premise that you need. And then you could independently relate it to the conclusion. Uh, so yeah, I've got to zoom through this just really quickly. This came across my Facebook feed this morning. Any, do we want to analyze this really quickly? Um, so simple logic, simple logic. One, the left hates America. Two, this is America. Three, Democrats are the left. Therefore, America hates the Democrats. OK, really quickly. So what I'd like to do, this is. I propose that this is not a great argument as written, uh, but I think that you can actually fix it up for him a little, right? You could make this a much more valid argument, much logically stronger argument by adding. There's one premise that does no work in the argument. Which premise is that? This is America. It does absolutely no work in this argument. So let's forget about that. Let's just think about uh, one, two, and four. So P1, P2, and four is the conclusion. So. <laughs> The left hates America. Democrats are the left. Is there any way to make those evidence for the conclusion that America hates the Democrats? Is there, is there some missing premise that you could add? Yeah. America hates things that hate it. Good, good. So if you, or even the more general thing, uh, people hate people that hate them, right? So that would make this, so we've got missing premise one. People hate people that hate them. Therefore, conclusion. A much better argument, isn't it? We got rid of one pointless premise that did no work. And you have this kind of like implicit thing uh, that you can, I mean, you're really helping this guy out. Like, it's not obvious that this is contained in the argument already. But if we're trying to make sense of this and be generous, I think you would assume something like people hate people that hate them, something like that. I hope that's not true in general, but. Here we are. All right. So uh, again, missing premises, in this case, missing premises need to be dependent with something because the job of a missing premise is to help you understand how a given premise, a non-missing premise, is relevant to the conclusion. And if it's not doing that, it's not doing what we want missing premises to do. And this is just to prevent you from just adding a bunch of background knowledge and random thoughts to argument diagrams. All right. Now, uh, just as a kind of preview, we're almost out of time, but just as a preview for next time, one of the most common types of missing premises are moral or evaluative premises. Uh, very, very often people will give you an argument that starts from facts and ends up with something like you should do this or this is bad or this is great, which is a normative or an evaluative claim. Uh, and I think people mostly leave these out because we agree on almost all questions of value. That might, that might be a controversial claim because like, people argue about values all the time, but like, almost everybody almost all the time agrees that it's bad to be cruel to innocent people for the fun of it, or it's bad to steal pe from people maliciously, or like, 
almost all of our social lives are organized around the fact that we just agree on values most of the time. So I think that's why people don't actually say they're missing premises, but as David Hume argued, you can't get a normative fact or a normative fact just from descriptive facts. So here's a descriptive argument. It's a purely descriptive argument where the missing premise is factual. And this other one was where the, you need these normative parts, these normative missing premises to derive the normative conclusion. All right, so we'll talk much more about normativity next time. Thanks. <laughs>